Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I see a few people just coming in to take their seats. I'm Jean Marie Titanico. I'm the Associate Director at the Getty Conservation Institute, and I'd like to welcome all of you here tonight to the Getty Center and to this evening's panel, which is entitled Sustainability and Heritage in a World of Change. Um, this is, in fact, the second panel that the Getty has hosted um, on this topic. The first was actually held in November of 2008 and discussed issues relating to climate change and cultural heritage sites and collections. That event, which was organized by the Getty Conservation Institute and the Natural Resources Defense Council, examined the ways that climate change will impact the historic built environment and how the core values of historic preservation, sustainability, and reuse of materials have a significant role to play in addressing this issue. Now tonight we're joined by three distinguished panelists who will be introduced to you shortly, who will try to help us to delve a little bit deeper into some of the ways that conservation practitioners are responding to issues of sustainability and the challenges that they present. And I should just say from the outset that as for the first event, tonight's discussion is based on the premise that there's sufficient scientific evidence to demonstrate that the planet is indeed under threat from climate change and that we need to act now to mitigate that threat. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce our moderator for this evening, Susan McDonald, who is a, a valued colleague of many years who joined the Getty Conservation Institute in 2008 as our head of field projects. Susan has a Bachelor of Architecture from the University of Sydney in Australia and a Master's in Conservation Studies from the University of York and from ECROM in Rome. Susan has worked um, in many capacities as a, as a private architect in her native Australia and England. She also worked for a number of years um, as a senior architectural conservator at English Heritage where she was involved in research, technical advice, training and, and publications related to building conservation. Then just prior to joining the GCI, she was director of the New South Wales Heritage Office in Australia, where she was involved in a very wide range of conservation issues from urban planning and development to policy and technical matters, including there the development of policy in response to the various pillars of the sustainability agenda. I should say Susan also has a, a very particular interest which you won't hear much about tonight, but in 20th century heritage conservation and was part of the team that developed the successful nomination of the Sydney Opera House to the World Heritage List. So I'm, I'm confident that tonight's discussion will be a very interesting and illuminating one. So without further delay, please join me in welcoming Susan McDonald, who will frame the conversation and introduce our panelists. Susan. Thanks, Jim Marie. And good evening, and welcome to the Getty Center. Um, before I present our three experts um, this evening, I want to just take a few minutes to introduce uh, our discussion. The terms sustainability, sustainable development, sustainable design have all become ubiquitous and are often used interchangeably, co-opted by industry, corporate entities, governments and heritage organisations anxious to demonstrate their role in saving the planet. One of the most familiar definitions of sustainability and the most commonly cited by conservation practitioners appeared in the 1987 report to the World Commission on Environment and Development entitled Our Common Future, which was chaired by John Brundtland. The report was a response to the General Assembly of the United Nations, their request to develop strategies of achieving sustainable development, to recommend ways and means of international cooperation to address environmental concerns that take into account the interrelationships between people, resources, environment and development, and to help define shared perspective and identify long-term objectives protecting and enhancing the environment. The Brundtland Commission's report defines sustainable development as development that meets, meets the present needs without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs, and I'm sure that this definition is um, familiar to most of you. It's also a definition that has immediate resonance with conservation practitioners. The Venice Charter, the enduring set of principles that guides cultural heritage conservation, recognises the importance of cultural heritage as a finite and irreplaceable resource, and the common responsibility to safeguard it for future generations in, and I quote, the full richness of, um, of their authenticity. The two definitions share some of the same tenets, intergenerational equity, for example, and the recognition of our generation's role as mere guardians of the legacies of a past that we wish, wish to pass on. It's also becoming more and more widely accepted that the conservation of cultural heritage is about the careful management of change, at least within the built heritage sector, and I think increasingly internationally. 
And this is an important point in this discussion because it assumes that all cultural heritage places and objects are subject to the ravages of time. And sustainable development too is a concept explicitly about this responsible management of change. And this emphasis of conservation practitioners now increasingly placing on, the cons on conservation as a change management process represents perhaps a, ch a change in thinking, a shift in, in thinking. We're not really happy anymore to be presented as preventers of change. I'm not quite sure exactly when this more explicit framing or positioning of conservation as a change management process first began to occur. And in trying to trace that back, it appears, perhaps coincidentally, that it seems to emerge about the same time as the Brunton Commission's report. Since that Commission's report, preservationists have been engaged in efforts to demonstrate the role that heritage conservation plays in meeting the global aims of sustainable development, but also to identify as way, ways that the sustainability agenda can advance conservation imperatives. And I think that's been to, to varying levels of success. Of course, it wasn't necessarily uh, a new concept. Um, you know, in response to the oil crisis of the 70s, preservationists uh, also uh, identified or promoted heritage conservation as a solution to that crisis. And although much valuable work has been done to demonstrate the social, cultural and economic value of heritage to, to enduring a civil society, it's the higher profile area of environmental sustainability where cultural conserva heritage conservation and sustainability um, agendas have not necessarily coalesced in the way that we perhaps might first have hoped and expected. Tonight we're going to focus somewhat on the environmental strand of, sus of the sustainability agenda, mostly around the issues of climate change and energy use. But, and we hope to examine if, where and how the conservation industry has responded to the imperatives of this pillar um, and where the challenges still lie for our built and movable heritage. But we'll also discuss the relationships between environmental, social and economic sustainability. I'd now like to welcome and introduce our panellists who will each present for about seven or eight minutes in order for us to frame tonight's discussion. After the three presentations, we'll have about 30 minutes of um, discussion around some of the issues raised. And then for the last 20 to 30 minutes, depending on how that goes, we'll um, open, the floor, uh, open the discussion to the floor and invite you all to make comments, ask questions, or to just generally join in our discourse. So, the pa our panellists tonight. Uh, Chris Wood is the Head of Building Conservation and, Re and Research Team at English Heritage, the government's principal advisor on the conservation of the nation's heritage, where he's worked for the last 17 years. Chris's experience and expertise spans a wide range of the built heritage sector. He's worked in the private sector and in local government. His current team specialises in dealing with the problems of deteriorating materials on historic structures. And more recently, he's been working on a number of initiatives that seek to improve the energy efficiency in historic buildings without causing harm to their character and appearance. English Heritage has probably done more than any other heritage organisation in terms of research and advice on climate change, energy management for historic buildings, and also on the social and economic pillars of the sustainability agenda. And I recommend checking out their uh, offshoot website. Um, climate Change in Your Home, which is a number of really uh, terrific documents about many of these issues on the subject, and I'm, Chris, I'm sure, will talk about and show you some more images of these. Um, Chris is going to share with us the work English Heritage is doing to respond to the UK government's actions and priorities in relation to climate change and where this has affected the nation's heritage. Um, Jean Caroon is the principal for preservation at Goody Clancy, a Boston design firm of 100 architects, planners and conservators. Her focus on the renovation and adaptive reuse of existing buildings has culminated in a portfolio of award-winning civic, institutional and religious structures, and we'll hear about one of these um, projects this evening. Many of them are landmark buildings. Nationally recognised for her achievements in the field of sustainable design for historic buildings, she's a member of the National Trust for Historic Preservation and Sustainability Coalition, Boston's Green Building Task Force, and is one of the founders of the Technical Committee on Sustainable Preservation with the Association for Preservation Technology, or APT as we know it. She's introduced new courses in a number of prestigious institutions on appropriately integrating sustainable design with historic structures, and she lectures frequently on this topic. Something that Jean left off her bio when she sent it to me was her recently published terrific book on this subject, Sustainable Preservation, Greening Existing Buildings. 
Jean will present a case study that demonstrates how appropriate conservation and reuse of historic buildings meets social, economic and environmental aims and the role conservation plays in city sustainable, city sustainable development strategies. The Getty's very own Jerry Padani uh, is a senior conservator at the Getty's Antiquities Museum. He's a past president of America, the American Institute for Conservation and is the elected president of the International Conservation of Institute. Institute for Conservation. He was awarded the AIC Rutherford John Gettins Award, which recognises outstanding service to the profession, and the Engineering Research Institute's Heritage Innovation Prize, which recognises outstanding contributions to the development of innovative solutions to preserve heritage. He's published widely in the field of conservation, disaster mitigation and response, the history of restoration, sustainable heritage preservation, and the changing role of heritage conservation in the public realm. Jerry developed the IIC's initiative, Dialogues in a New Century, a series of events that encouraged discussions and considerations of the relationship between heritage conservation to the modern world. And in fact, um, Jerry was just mentioning to me that you can download uh, the uh, transcript of a roundtable on climate change and uh, collections from the IIC uh, website. Um, so welcome to our panellists. I'd like now to invite Chris Wood to the lectern and then Chris will um, pass uh, the baton on to, uh, to Jean and following that we'll have our discussion. Welcome Chris. Thank you for that introduction Susan and good evening everyone. Now in this uh, not the first slide. In this um, very brief uh, introduction, I'm going to describe what's going on in the UK, especially in regard to our heritage, sustainability uh, and climate change, who we are at English Heritage and what we're actually doing about it, and if there's time, I want to end up with a few points for discussion. The first thing to mention in relation to the subject matter is that we are extremely concerned about sustainability. We think it's a fundamental aim of conservation to make the best use of scarce resources and of course you won't be surprised to know that we consider that the um, historic environment and particularly buildings are a very scarce resource, a valuable resource that demands conservation. So of course it can be enjoyed by future generations. The problem is for us in the UK though that our biggest single prob uh, issue is dealing with climate change and what we find is that in fact measures to uh, mitigate climate change in fact are causing a lot of damage to historic buildings. Of course the counter argument goes that if we don't deal with climate change of course we're going to get this sort of situation which you see in the picture there. In case any of you are unfamiliar with that particular scene, it is the House of Parliament in the centre of London, the seat of our elected representatives, and the reason I've shown this slide before to audience at home is to show the gravity of the situation. Unfortunately, the prospect of our uh, elected politicians being flooded out has been received with such popularity that the <laughs> message has been uh, somewhat lost. <laughs> Oops, big pardon. Now, our climate in the UK is described as temperate, i.e. it is warm and very damp. We don't generally suffer extremes, although some people would dispute <coughs> that in the, the last decade. The, the, uh, uh, the um, expected scenario with uh, climate change is that uh, our climate is going to get warmer and drier but we're going to suffer a lot more dramatic um, rain events. Sea levels are due to rise and that's going to account for quite a significant uh, amount of low-lying land. Now, buildings are reckoned to account for about half our carbon emissions and this is created when uh, we create uh, energy to heat, light and ventilate buildings. For those of you who've been to the UK will know that uh, air conditioning is not a major requirement. At least not yet, anyway. So our need is obviously to improve services like boilers, pipe work, etc. And to make sure that um, heat losses from uh, walls, roofs, windows, etc. are minimised. 
Now, by 2050, the government are aiming to reduce carbon emissions by 80%. And by that time, we reckon 75% of the buildings that will be there have already been built. So the emphasis, obviously, on tackling the issue on existing buildings, which, of course, includes historic buildings. What are our government priorities? Well, I suppose it's like all governments, is to make sure they get elected next time. And of course, if the lights go out, so do they. Now, for our government, it's a particularly difficult problem because our energy is provided by 93% of fossil uh, fuels. And we've got basically aging coal-fired power stations, aging nuclear reactors, and we import gas from very unreliable countries. So we have some problems. Other issues for government include uh, fuel poverty. Now, fuel poverty basically is a description for households that have to spend more than 10% of their disposable income on heating. And the numbers are rising dramatically as energy costs spiral. The other thing is that the government is now seeing the green agenda as a possible uh, future boom for employment, which is obviously a good thing. However, the prospect of uh, droves of unskilled tradesmen ripping buildings apart to install insulation fills us with a degree of trepidation. In terms of action, the government to keep tightening up the building regulations. Um, they have a, an aim of producing 30% um, of our energy, I think it is, by 20, uh, 2020 from green sources and there is uh, lots of incentives now to home owners to uh, install ins uh, insulation in their homes. A little bit about us. Um, as Susan said, we're not actually a government department, although we're mainly sponsored by government. We are described as the government's advisors on all aspects of the historic environment. We're probably best known for the 400 or, or so sites that uh, we look after. And there's three examples on the right there. As you'll see, energy efficiency is not a major issue for most of our estate. Now, our remit only covers England. When we were set up, we were allowed to work anywhere in the world, with the exception of Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. <laughs> and you will note we are called the United Kingdom. Actually, come to think, think of it, we haven't had a king, have we? For 60 years either. Um, any rate, our major, our, our remit is very wide. We cover everything from historic landscapes right through to shipwrecks off the coast. Most of our work obviously involves historic buildings and archaeology, um, but I suppose we're probably best known, again, as Susan said, for a lot of the uh, publications that we produce uh, following our research. Uh, and these are just a selection of the uh, more recent ones. Now, we do actually support the government's aim. We do believe that historic buildings can be made more energy efficient um, without ruining their character. What we have a problem with is the automatic assumption that old buildings are necessarily inefficient, and of course this is implied in every single one of the uh, government's models. We also believe that a considerable amount of energy savings can be made in the way people use uh, energy. Uh, and again, significant improvements can be made without major interventions. And this is something we're hoping to uh, prove in our Half and Home project, which we um, started on last year. Essentially what we're doing is concentrating on these house types, these are 18th and 19th century, we call them terraces, but I gather you call them row houses. Um, they are our most pro common house type. There's probably about four and a quarter million of these. Um, they represent about a fifth of all uh, buildings. And they're regarded by the government as one of the hardest to uh, deal with. And what we're doing, working with uh, local housing associations uh, and local authorities, we're carrying out detailed surveys um, of the performance of the buildings before any improvements are carried out. We're obviously me measuring the energy use as well, but also how the walls, roofs, windows perform. Improvements that we approve of are then carried out. 
We carry on the monitoring uh, and that will continue for probably two or three years afterwards. So we hope to build up some useful data, not only on energy use but how people actually uh, use it. We're also going to um, introduce training or we're introducing specialist craftsmen to local colleges to train them in actually how to do these things uh, properly. We're continuing to provide advice on how to um, implement the new building regulations without wrecking buildings. And of course we're involved in uh, quite a number of similar sort of schemes involving other uses such as uh, churches, offices uh, and colleges. Now I just want to finish off with a few points, possibly for debate later. Um, dealing with climate change, of course, is a global problem. And although we in the UK are a fairly small uh, generator of carbon now, we accept our responsibility because, of course, we invented the problem in the first place. We've got 250 years of our carbon up there. But the main point I want to make, of course, is that historic buildings are a finite resource, and once they are destroyed, they are destroyed forever. Now, a leading member of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change said that uh, the UK is responsible for 3% of carbon emissions, historic buildings probably account for 6%, 6% of 3% is absolutely negligible, and quite honestly, if you wrecked your whole historic building stock, it would make no difference at all to climate change. There are major incentives now for householders to uh, insulate their, um, drastically insulate their homes, which of course seems to be a bit of an anomalous situation. Our climate is fairly warm already, and it's reckoned that uh, we're just going to get a lot warmer. But of course the last point I want to make is that the pace of technology is um, advancing extremely quickly. We're expecting to be producing a third of our energy by green sources by 2020, as I said. Um, and these improvements are going on all the time. So my message is that uh, we need to take a measured approach and remember that old buildings are a highly sustainable resource if adapted sensibly. Thank you. Good evening. A thank you to the Getty and to Susan for that nice introduction, and uh, both the Getty for having me and for engaging in this conversation. As the uh, I'm a representative of the the uh, working class here in private sector as an architect, so I'm going to take advantage of that to use a case study to talk about these issues. And the case study is a, a very important building. It is Trinity Church in the city of Boston. But I would posit that it is a case study that actually applies to all buildings because what I would most like you to take away from this evening, from my point of view, is that unless we change our world from one of consumption to one of stewardship, there is really no hope. And stewardship is what is all about. You cannot disconnect environmental concerns from stewardship. And stewardship of our largest assets, our buildings, all buildings, is absolutely essential to what we need to accomplish in the next millennia and the next 20 years especially. So please look at the examples I'm giving in the conversation about such an important building and remember that these really apply to all buildings. The premise of what we did at Trinity Church, and I was privileged to work on this building for about five years, was really based on, the, on issues of stewardship. Stewardship in three different areas. Stewardship of the building and the art within the building itself. Stewardship of the institution, Trinity Church. This is its third building within the city of Boston. And stewardship of the environment, of course. But within all of those were economic realities, realities of codes, realities of officials, realities of place within a living city and a living institution. Uh, nothing about this project was easy, which really was what made it so fun. Uh, for instance, the church was, we worked on the church for five years. The church was never closed because the church uh, stayed completely functional. All 
work was done in a way so wedding pictures wouldn't be harmed, uh, wouldn't show any construction photos around it. Everything was about making the institution and the place work while we were doing the stewardship itself. So our work began on this iconic building by looking at the research of what had been done before, where it stood with its place in history, where it stood now, what had changed around it, why the Hancock Tower was increasing the wind currents on one side, what that meant for the stone, what was the driving forces. We looked at the amount of change that had happened within a living church of 125 years. Uh, as a practitioner within preservation, I believe very strongly that our role is not to freeze buildings in place. Buildings are living, wonderful things, and we are about managing change, managing the memories, managing the future, managing the present. It's always important as we work with clients to remind them that throughout the history of a building or a place there has been change, and we are one piece of that long continuum. So we looked at the history of what had happened inside the building, outside the building, and around it. We had a very wonderful client who allowed us to do the kind of research that every project should be entitled to that included laser measurements of the building so that we could have accurate documentation. We had uh, sensors within the building for uh, and within the crawl spaces and the attic for over a year to monitor temperature and climate change to make sure that the existing conditions were, or to analyze whether the existing conditions were harming the very beautiful paintings that are essential to the uh, essential part of the inside of the building, and determined actually that the existing climate uh, inside the building was not harming the art, in which case our mandate to do no harm became even more important. So our stewardship of the fabric was about uh, done with thorough research, but while that research was happening, we were also researching what the existing conditions of the institution were, making recommendations about uh, the, the return on investment, what they could accomplish. The project was specifically divided into six parts so that if fundraising was unsuccessful, we could stop the project at any time after any phase. And I would, I would uh, remind all here who just happened to be going to Boston and might want to make a contribution, that we only were able to accomplish about half the work that we recommended. Despite the fact that it was a $42 million project, we really realized that after 125 years with modern conditions, the church would have been best served if we could have spent $80 million all in one fell swoop. For a private congregation of 1,000 people, that was a little bit of a bite. But they did take on the 42 million. We did do it in six specific phases. We did do it in a way that was woven together to value what was the most important pieces of the conservation and the most important pieces of keeping the church a vital institution and a successful part of the uh, city community. The first thing we did was installed ground source heat pumps around the outside of the building to provide heating and cooling through a ground uh, through use of the ground. This was probably the thing that has gained the most uh, uh, press for this building, but uh, I would just point out that this is only one part of the project. The ground source heat pumps have been successful. They are, if you're ever in Boston, they're about twice as deep as the Hancock Tower is tall. There are six of them scattered around the church. Uh, set within about 10 feet of the John Lafarge windows. It was a little harrowing to do this uh, with Texas drillers who had probably never heard of John Lafarge and didn't appreciate being asked to drill during Lent uh, in Boston. We also worked our way around the building, taking care of waterproofing, replacing some of the uh, 4,000 piling tops that were, were uh, not stable anymore. We captured all of the rainwater that falls on the building, store it underneath the building to flood the, the site again. Because the building sits on wood pilings, they need to be maintained and kept underwater. So the water conservation, although an environmental issue, is primarily a stewardship issue about keeping uh, the area below the church well inundated. 
We worked on the outside of the building only on the tower, and this was largely because of uh, funding and largely because of the fact that the most important art is inside that tower. So the, the restoration and repairs that were really about stewardship and extension of service life focused just on the tower. I would just point out here that whenever you maintain any object, whether it's a paper cup or a building, when you extend its life by two, you decrease its environmental impact by half. So extending the service life of our buildings is actually the most environmental thing that we can do as far as avoiding the impact of new material <coughs> use. Uh, taking care of our buildings is of the highest importance regardless of what building it is. So to take care of the institution, we moved to the underside of the building to reclaim space and keep the church vital. We looked at ways of excavating the building underneath it. We couldn't expand on that particular site or do it easily. So all of the needed space for the program was found below the building and added about 10,000 square feet of programmable space. We turned to the parish house, which had been changed many, many, many times, so we could take advantage of that as an area where we could increase the density of use, increase the flexibility, increase the security. But even here, we had a, a strategy that was to do as little harm as possible and be as reversible as possible. Uh, our belief is that if we can make a building like this last for a thousand years, our part in it should be as lightly touched as, as it can be. So the space we added here were removable. There are treated as furniture pieces. Inside the building, of course, from a, from a conservation point of view, this is where the real fun happened because this is where the scaffolding went up to take care of the John Lafarge murals that are on the inside of the building and to do so in a way that would protect them for another 50 to 100 years. They had been uh, significantly worked on 50 years ago uh, in a perhaps not very compatible way. So we were able to uh, use new technologies, new investigation to, uh, to treat them with a little bit more respect and a little bit uh, more kindness. The stained glass is the last piece. There are, uh, of all the windows in the building, we recommended that 10 be restored, working with Julie Sloan as the conservator, as the consultant. Uh, this is the place that actually the funding ran out. And this window, the Christ in Majesty, has now been out of the building for three years. It's been fully restored, uh, but the last half million needed to put it back into place has not yet been raised. So uh, it, it, is a, it is a hardship for us not to be able to see it in its place, but it is coming, and we are optimistic about it. The piece that is the most sustainable about this project, not the ground source heat pumps, not the reduction of materials. We were very careful to use as minimal materials as possible uh, to uh, keep the exposure of the building as it was, to use local products, all of the things that you hear now in, the, in so much of the mantra. But the real stewardship, the real importance of this project, and the real importance of all uh, sustainable work is really about placemaking and the importance of where we are and who we are and where we've been and where we're going. It's easy to say with an iconic building that uh, you can do that, but it actually is about whole neighborhoods and whole cities, about our largest built environment, which is what we work in, what we live in. So placemaking for the unique character of this building was really what we champion and what we love the most. We have an institution that has been a vital part of the city of Boston for over 300 years. Over a thousand groups use this space. They still use this space. And this is what it's about. This is what bringing people to this place is the most sustainable feature of this project. Thank you. Good evening, and um, my thanks as well to the GCI for this invitation. I consider this topic one of the most challenging that uh, heritage preservation and conservation has faced since its beginning and probably will face for a, a very long time. Um, Susan has defined, oops, sorry about that. Susan has defined um, uh, some of the meanings of this word. 
Um, but I think we should consider that it's also a terribly overused word uh, to the point where it risks trivializing whatever it's coupled with. That is, until we consider the serious implications to our lives, uh, to our future, and to our home planet. It's important, therefore, to explore how it relates or how it should relate uh, to heritage itself. Now, I come um, from the collection side of heritage, from the movable heritage as compared to the immovable heritage, the made and collected uh, rather than the built and lived in. Still, however, it's heritage, and it shares a lot of the same challenges uh, that my colleagues face in built heritage preservation, but the definitions uh, remain somewhat complex and somewhat synthetic. So I think you can probably tell right away that the world of heritage preservation has a few challenges with respect to definitions. Um, and, and it's worth, I think, considering just for a moment uh, some of the definitions of words that we're using tonight. Sustainability means a lot of things. Will it last? Can it last? If we make it last, if we put that effort into it, can we afford it? And payments, by the way, uh, come in a range of possible formats like money or public interest or finite natural resources. And when we tally up all those resources spent, will it seem worth it? Will it seem worth it in the future? And who decides if it was worth it? Now, that definition of sustainability has a lot in common with the term preservation, which could be defined this way, as, as the prolongation of usefulness. But even then, um, we run into some problems, uh, particularly uh, a problem with defining usefulness, which is a fickle term. But for the, for the sake of this discussion, let's say that it incorporates any and all the values that we assign to heritage, tangible and intangible. Now, using the term usefulness and the limiting implications of the term prolongation suggests that there's some end point to that thing which we have been trying to hold on to, to preserve. Realizing that is a seismic shift in my profession, particularly in the collections end, where we have shouldered mostly the self-imposed burden of saving the world's heritage for the future, a burden made heavier by viewing the future as an idealistic continuum. We rarely define what we mean by the future. All that weight has, a limit, has limited our approach and has certainly limited our point of view. I was waiting for my son one day in a Southern California mall, and I came upon this really beautiful sort of little fountain park area. And I read the sign, it reminded me of our old approach. It's beautiful, but you can't touch. You can't use it. It's always a no situation for the sake of preservation. It's restrictive, it's presumptive, and it's a little bit, or maybe a lot, elitist. Our special status that we took on as scientists, I mean, we must have taken it on. We wore white coats for many years, distanced us even more from the users and from our essential purpose. All of that led to a rather myopic approach resulting in what we could call the whatever it takes attitude. It should be preserved, it should be saved for the future and whatever it takes will do it. Now, we shouldn't be surprised, but we were, when relatively recently we became part of the problem. We were the ones who were asking for too much energy consumption. We, in our effort to try to maintain 
the kind of strict environmental conditions within collections were suddenly the ones that were no longer sustainable. And it's taken a while, but a change is occurring. We're broadening our approach. We're realizing the connection between this and this, that massive amount of energy that it takes to maintain this, those collections. But it's a relatively new approach that's going to take some time for us to adapt. We've already made some significant headway. The Leeds Initiative, for example, although mostly applied to new museums when it comes to, uh, to new buildings when it comes to museums. ASHRAE, the American Society for Heating, Refrigeration, and Air Conditioning Engineers, have actually included a chapter for museums and libraries to make their systems more efficient. The 2008 IC Congress on Access led to the Roundtable on Climate Change and Collections. The question posed to those speakers, those panelists, was one day when your director comes in and says, I need a new podium. Now, when the director comes in and says, I can't afford what you're asking for, tell me why I need to keep paying for it. What will you say? It was surprising how few conservators could make a cogent and reasonable case for what they were demanding. The GCI, of course, and the Natural Resources Defense Council has forged the way for new partnerships. But perhaps our greatest contribution has been in increasing efficiency, replacement of old machinery or tuning old machinery, and the reconsideration of new museum design based and dependent on passive microclimates rather than large and expensive equipment. We are also on the verge of reevaluating our climate guidelines. And the UK certainly leads this effort uh, with the Arts and Humanities Council, Environmental Guidelines and Opportunities and Risks, otherwise known as IGOR. And the National Endowment for the Humanities has recently launched a series of grants emphasizing the achievement of sustainability. <coughs> But there are other assets that we should not forget that were touched on just now. And that's our contribution to the continuation of the recognition that we care for something. We care for what we pass on to the future and what we value. Heritage, heritage preservation is an expression of who we are. As Samuel Jones and Jim Holden wrote in their book, it's a material world uh, that came out of the uh, UK think tank Demos. Conservation refreshes and sustains the values of the past and reflects the values of the present and the future. To do that, we need broader input. To take just for a moment and look at the economist James Tobin's definition of sustainability in 1974, he simply said, it's a maintenance of balance. We have not been so good on the collection's end in balancing all that is around us. Tobin suggested some pillars. In his world, they were social, environmental, and economic. They achieved intergenerational <coughs> equity. In our world, we have stuck with engineers, scientists, art historians. It's time to broaden, include the public, include their concerns, and include all of our futures. One opportunity to, we need to, basically we need to be more relevant beyond our core mission and the preservation of cultural heritage to become a larger concern and contributor in the world of preservation of natural resources. Thank you.
I didn't have glasses on before, did I? That's the problem. <laughs> okay, well, uh, thank you very much to our, our panellists for um, introducing a lot of different issues for us um, and giving us some insight into some of the, the different ways and initiatives that um, different sectors of our community are addressing some of these challenges. Um, I wanted to um, come back to some of the actions that are being undertaken uh, in the conservation industry and um, I'll start by asking you all how you think heritage conservation uh, is faring internationally in terms of either being recognising, recognised as contributing to uh, sustainable development or being successful in, uh, in, in harnessing um, or being assisted by some of the uh, sustainability um, development initiatives and policies and legislation. And have we as an industry been left out of or behind in the discussions? Uh, and as a result of that, have some of the conflicts that, that we've heard a little bit about, um, have, have they arisen because of, of uh, us not being at the table in the way that we may have anticipated at the beginning of this uh, discussions about this issue? I'm waiting for Chris. Oh, you can start. <laughs> we don't have to go in order. Oh. Okay. Well, I don't think we're at the table. I mean, I think this. I think that the the green community and we we continue to try and solve the problem with the in the same way we've created the problem. We continue to believe that consumption is the answer. So we create new green buildings and new green houses and new green products and and uh, consumption isn't the answer. The assumption of consumption is, is, uh, is still driving uh, the conversation about environmental stewardship. And uh, until we can shift it to a conversation about stewardship, I don't believe that there's, that uh, I, I think that that's the real challenge. And I, it seems so self-evident to me that it's frustrating that it isn't self-evident to the environmental movement and to all of us as we're out there uh, working to save the natural world. You used the uh, word internationally, Susan. I can't really comment on that. I can just tell you what uh, my perceptions are about the UK. Um, in some regards, we have been actually at the table. So we've been more fortunate than that. I think we were at the table simply because we raised objections at the right time, and therefore we were invited to sit on one or two committees where we were able to voice um, concerns and opinions. But I think I agree very much with Jean, in fact, what it comes down to now in the UK is it's much more commercially driven decision making. Some of the um, concepts obviously we're driving forward, particularly when it comes to sustainability, the good idea is that they're regarded as a bit nebulous. They can understand very much the issues relating to climate change. But as I say, we have a paradoxical situation where we're dealing with issues um, that perhaps mitigate climate change in their, eye, in, in their eyes. But it's running completely counter to the, the goals of, of sustainability. And, um, I think, as I say, that concept, uh, it doesn't really have any major significance when it comes to decision making in, uh, in the UK. Well, obviously I'm going to paint with a really broad brush and there are conservators out there working with collections who would certainly not fit this categorization, but I think in general, um, the collections folk uh, are not at the table. They don't even know where the table is. And they're not terribly sure what they can bring to the table. At least there isn't full agreement on what they can bring to the table. And so that issue of um, is it worth it has to be answered. Uh, if we're going to put resources into saving this, we need to make sure that the way we're using the resources make, makes sense. If we can't do that, then we're not sustainable. And Jerry, if I can just ask you something, 
else about that. I, I think that a lot of the work that, that Chris and, and Jean, that you've been involved in, is really being driven by a response to legislation, changes in building codes and industry-driven schemes um, such as LEED. But um, in the music, what about the museum sector, Jerry? And uh, is the response to the to these issues being driven by the same sort of things, or is there another motivation for uh, starting to examine some of the issues that we've been talking about? I think there's a strong motivation on the part of conservators to to live up to that title in a broader way, and so they're interested in contributing uh, uh, to a better world. Um, whether their contribution in total would be significant or not, uh, in reality, uh, I'm, I'm not so sure about, but I think the expression is, is a good one. So I don't think we're being necessarily driven by any kind of legislation. In fact, in the United States, there are federal regulations of how to care for collections like archives that come in complete contradiction to some of the regulations for uh, sustainability and greening. Um, so I think we're driven mostly by professional motives and by personal motives. Mm -hmm. And what about um, the issue of cost that you alluded to uh, when you were speaking? Is that something else that's, that's having an impact about the on the standards for collections care? And um... Well, en energy is more costly. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a lot of demand to reduce those costs. Uh, sustainability is brought into the equation. Um, it's not directly, this is just costing more, it's now it's costing more and we need to be greener. Uh, therefore, defend the kinds of requirements uh, you have for protecting the collection or expand them. So, it, it's, you know, it's a, it, there was someone else in one of your first, uh, uh, GCI's first roundtables uh, uh, about sustainability and climate change that noted this is uh, just a fantastic opportunity masquerading as an insurmountable problem. And, and I think for conservation, it, this is a wonderful opportunity. Uh, we can contribute to the overall health of the planet, but we can also clarify and verify the kinds of guidelines we've put out there in the past when energy was really rather cheap. I think, I think that's actually what you just, that's very key. I think there's a real, we really have to change the way we're, uh, the con we have to change the whole conversation because this, this climate change isn't something that's going to be solved or that we're, that it, it is, it's here, it's inevitable. We've, we, we messed up, the, we've changed the earth, we're still changing it. And so it's really just a, it's a new conversation about what are we going to do right now and in the next hundred years about how we take care of, of all that is around us, including our, the objects. Because I guess this it would come down to which objects are so precious that they need to be maintained in a way that they're really not going to age at all. Is that, that becomes the sort of part of the... the, the it, it might come down to triage object to object. Other than or, you and me, of course. <laughs> right. it, it might come down to um, the importance and where, where collections, where heritage is on the priority list when London looks like a lake. You know, where, where does heritage sit on our priority? Or well, actually what I liked about the Getty is in that odd pause as we all think about losing <laughs> the Getty collection or something, is the thing that I've always found that I, get, gives me hope about the way the Getty approaches things is, is what is the right level of protection, is the, which is what you were alluding yeah. to, and how can it be achieved without a dependency on, uh, on traditional mechanical systems, or traditional within the last 50 years mechanical systems. So, so the work that the Getty has done on other sites where they're high humidity and different mm -hmm. kinds of, of how do you use, how do we remember physics? Mm. How do we use physics? The hot and humid climate. The hot and humid uh, climate. Uh, and how do we, how do we still get yeah. the kind of, of environment that we want without a dependency on mechanical systems? And, and what is the level of the environment we need? And in that conversation, we, we had this fascinating exchange earlier that those people working in the built environment seem to 
consider a change of definition for conservation as management of change as old hat. And again, painting with a broad brush, I think I can say those on the collection side are still not quite used to that definition, the idea of managing change, that eventually we will lose these things. Now that's a sad thing to say, but eventually we will, and that changes the conversation, it changes the rules of the conversation, and the kinds of resources that you pour into preservation. Um, that, that doesn't mean that we should just throw up our hands and say, well, whatever survives, survives, because again, we should at least make the effort, and then again, there's that expression to the world about w defining ourselves, what we care for, uh, who we are and where we've been, and what we can learn from it, and the fact that we're defined, again, we're defined by what we care for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that is very true, and certainly about in terms of the built heritage, this idea of managing change. I mean, we've accepted slightly new definitions and a wider view of conservation. We talk about significance and particular values. And we accept that buildings are going to be lost. You know, our rising coastal uh, tides and sea level rises means we are going to be losing, there's no question about it. And, um, you know, we've accepted those will go. A lot of our most important archaeological sites uh, are already subject to severe flooding. We can do what we can, but we, I think there's an inevitability we are going to lose some. And we, we try to do what is reasonable. I think the point I was making about the built environment with the slides I was showing is that <clears throat> every aspect of those houses has value. The windows, for example, where the original timber windows survive. I mean, they're 100, 200 years old. They're made of timber you can't source legally today. It's such a wonderful quality. To throw those away when we can repair them, we can make them as good as double glazing or insulated glazing, as you call it, by benign methods, is ludicrous. And yet, we are, uh, through the building regulations, they're almost encouraged to do that, to be replaced by plastic. Plastic which lasts 10 years. So, I mean, you know, there's a terrible dichotomy here. Mm. Now, everything, as I said, that uh, we are looking to uh, conserve has a useful life has a huge embodied energy, and I think it's very easy to justify what we actually assert as being sensible adaptation. I think the time frames might be different between yeah. buildings and collections, because the sense what we define as use is very different. Putting something in a museum, inviting people to come see it, is use. Mm. It's different than you know, walking through it or living in it, but the principle remains the same. Mm. Is that shocking to you? I have a feeling <laughs> it's like there's some conservators up here talking about letting things go. Maybe somebody might like to comment on that when we, when we open the floor. Um, and I think, Jean, too, when we were talking over dinner, you were saying that you know, it's about some people's interpretation of what green might be it seems to be quite limited. We've limited the discussion. And, and Jean was quoting uh, dealing with an architect uh, who was proposing to replace all the windows with plastic ones because it was demanded in lead. Uh, and we've somehow kind of got ourselves into this um, you know, mismatch of basic principles and how you define success in relation to this, to this area of, of what being green or being environmentally sustainable might be. Can I ask a <laughs> question of the audience? Um, it's 2011 now. Uh, uh, in 2003, I spoke at the National Trust, at the National Preservation Conference, and asked the audience of several hundred people who in the audience knew what LEED was. And uh, maybe 25 people raised their hands. Who in the audience in this audience doesn't know what LEED is? All right. Thank you. I'm really relieved to know that in seven years it hasn't completely swept the entire world. Um, <laughs> The LEAD is, a, is an acronym for Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design. 
uh, L-E-E-D. It was created by an organization called the U.S. Green Building Council, USGBC. It's a nonprofit organization, which is surely one of Harvard's case studies for successful business development. Uh, they have had rapid growth. When we started the, the Trinity Church Project in 2000, the system for evaluating buildings to determine whether they were supposedly green using the leadership in energy and environmental design had barely come off the shelf. Uh, wasn't very much commonly, you didn't speak of it very much. But in 2002, the largest landlord in the country, the General Services Administration, mandated that their buildings would follow the LEED guidelines. And uh, clearly, when the largest landlord in a country says that LEED is going to be important, all architects, builders, engineers, scramble to find out what this means and become very versed in it. And that began the sort of snowball wave of using uh, the, the U.S. Green Building Council system in this country as the measurement for whether a building is or is not green. Uh, the system has been widely criticized as not being very sympathetic to existing buildings. I don't agree with that. I think that that's, you can make any building you want meet the LEED system, and we've done it successfully. There are numerous historic buildings that are the highest levels of LEED. I think what the LEED system does assume is that um, it, it is more or less targeted in the initial days. It, the systems are really targeted towards new construction, and that is the terrible, terrible fallacy. Uh, when we look at existing buildings or existing objects, it isn't that they have uh, so much the embodied energy in them, because that's done. The environmental effect of making this chair is gone. It's over. Uh, whatever uh, waste was created, whatever stream was ruined, whatever trees were cut down, that's gone. What, what reusing this chair does and reusing this building and reusing and extending the service life of an object does is it avoids the environmental impact of making a new chair, of making a new building. And so to, to talk about new buildings as being green is, is a joke. I mean, a new building isn't green. It, it, it just isn't. It's, it's, and so because of the resources that went into it, it is maybe less bad than buildings that might have been made at a different time. It may be even less bad than the building that was already there. But there, you cannot make something and not have an extraordinary environmental impact that is upstream, downstream, everywhere. And so that's the, the fallacy of the LEED system, um, that, that it, it assumes, it's, it's just trying to make us less bad. As, as Bill Reed, who, who talks a lot about regenerative design, says, if we all do lead, we will just kill the earth less, slow, we'll kill it more slowly, you know. So it, it's, that's, but thank you for the five people who didn't know what lead is. That gives me some, <laughs> assume they're not architects. <laughs> or they're unemployed architects. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I wanted to come back to the interrelationships between economic, social, and environmental uh, sustainability a little bit. Because I think one of the things that seems to have, have happened more recently is that the focus is all on environmental so uh, sustainability and largely about energy, as, as Chris was saying. Um, and I wanted to ask you whether this focus on these issues has really impeded broader conservation um, uh, successes, and in fact, uh, what sustainable development is actually meant to be about. Right, another large question. Um, we had a, a little chat beforehand and I was explaining another project that we were involved in. And what we're trying to do uh, is to encourage the um, reopening of our stone quarries in England, um, the ones that created so many of the historic buildings. I and mean, we've got a great deal of uh, different stones. Um, because of our climate, it's absolutely essential that we get the right stones to repair. So there's great conservation need to, uh, to reopen these. 
We know where they are, we're doing surveys to find them, we are coming up against a lot of problems and objections. Um, and one of, the, one of the main arguments we have, of course, we think it's highly sustainable to open quarries again, small quarries we're talking about. We're talking about sort of low transport needs, very little waste. But what we're talking about is actually opening quarries in villages, rural areas where employment, unemployment is very high, where these were the sort of traditional trades that, uh, that went on. And it ticks lots of boxes. It's not just um, economic, it's environmental, uh, because the right sort of stone is being used for the buildings and also for new buildings. And it's social. It does a lot for local communities. We come up against objections, not just because people don't like the idea of quarries, but actually from government itself, because um, they look on it in a purely modernistic way, in a commercial way, I suppose, and say, well, look, we are very wedded to free trade in this country, even though that particular operation you described is very cheap to run. The fact is, Chinese imported stone of a similar type is literally half the price. Why bother? Um, and we keep fighting this, and we're doing the best we can, and we're lobbying where we can in Parliament and what have you. But it's a very, very difficult issue to get over to those, you say, who make the decisions. Um, and it's one of those few uh, examples, I think, where we, we sort of embrace all three facets of sustainability. And the issue is, is plain to me. And at the moment, we're having an extremely difficult job to, as I say, um, regenerate these, uh, these old quarries, and despite all the benefits that go with them. We ran into the same thing. We were talking about this at dinner time. We had just, it's an uphill battle. It's really, it is always about the economy. I have a building in uh, the University of, okay, I won't say. I have a building at a university. It's a 1950s building. It's a nice building. It has uh, solid core doors in it that were put in 10 years ago. There are 300 of these doors. They're only 10 years old. It is less expensive to replace the doors in kind than to refinish them. The contractor and I, the contractor has made the doors have become sort of the symbol of my, my passion. And he says, well, he keeps coming back to me with alternatives. He says, what if we use them as the fencing? I said, no, no, it doesn't matter. I don't want them as fencing. That just delays when they go to landfill. I want to refinish the doors. And the owner's going, well, and the owner gets it, but it's still, it's, you don't pay the full value for the new product. You don't pay for the upstream, downstream degradation. And so a restoration project, every dollar spent in a restoration project creates 20% more jobs. Every state in the union has documented this. And we still can't make restoration, preservation, sustainability, and stewardship one and the same thing. So I'm constantly battling with the fact that the new window, the new door, the new floor, the new whatever is less expensive than the labor to take care of something, to actually take, repair something. Repair is never the most effect, cost effective in this economy where you don't pay the full cost. You don't pay the environmental degradation for that stone coming from China. No. You don't pay because they don't have the same controls. And it's, it's, it's a global issue, but it affects what we're able to do in our oh. community. Oh. Um, we, we're running short on time, but I'm just going to ask you all very brief, briefly uh, to follow on from, from that, Jean, is that, so what's next for our sector? I mean, what, where do we need to go next? What, what's, um, what are our challenges and what perhaps are our opportunities in, 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 uh, in this? Well, you said architecture, so I'm... <laughs> oh, <laughs> um, nice I, 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 think, yeah. <laughs> I, I think for collections, it, it, for us, it's, it's pretty clear what, what's next. It, it's to take advantage of this opportunity to try to really understand in a very clear, objective way, in a provable way, what we need to prolong the usefulness of our collections. And we need to accept that word prolong and all that it carries with it. We need to have a lot of discussions about what we mean by future and quit pretending that it's forever. 
uh, so that we become part of reality. Uh, we're having a discussion internationally now with a lot of museum directors who, who think that energy consumption in the museum is our fault because we demand such strict guidelines. But we'll turn the other way to the kind of uh, consumption that traveling exhibitions take. So the broader picture is our future and to be part and to influence that broader picture for the health of the planet uh, and for our own sustainability, I think, is clearly our future. We have to change the dialogue. We have to change the dialogue to be one about uh, that's holistic, that recognizes the social and economic features, and that really changes us to a culture in which repair and renovation and stewardship are rewarded and, and essentially mandated. We have to break away from the pattern of consumption. And I, I don't honestly know exactly how to do that. I, I am grateful for organizations like the Getty. Uh, the National Trust has a green lab in Seattle that's working hard. We rely a great deal on English heritage and historic Scotland for much of the research they've done. So um, when Chris is all doom and gloom, I get all doom and gloomy too. But I know he's <laughs> offering some. He's doing great work on energy that I'm counting on. So. Well, that's very nice of you to say that, Jean. I was actually going to say, yes, I have uh, probably sounded extremely do uh, gloomy. But I would have to say that uh, certainly at home, there's a lot of people who do understand these issues. They are interested, they are concerned. We cannot compete against the commercial sector. Uh, there's no point, there's too few of us. We cannot compete against people who are selling windows, for example. But we can put an awful lot of information out there. Unfortunately, we tend usually to only be listened to by our friends. But I do think that sort of circle is widening. Um, and I do actually realise that um, the work we're doing, uh, that I sort of described to you, that hearth and homework, it is terribly important to be able to show living examples of everything we say. And by living example, one of the best stories I heard when I, had to, I sit on the uh, Building Regulations Committee, um, and they've been struggling for years to get the Minister to take any interest, despite the fact we building regulations were being tightened. She just wasn't interested. Until they took her to Denmark and they showed some buildings, some green buildings in Denmark. And her comments were, she said, if you'd actually taken me to a real building instead of giving me all these SAP ratings and <laughs> U values and stuff like that, walked me around and showed me and spoke to the people who lived there and we could actually see the benefits, I was far more impressed and moved by that. And the changes that came about in a short space of time was quite interesting. Mm -hmm. And I think this is the sort of tack that we're going to try and follow. We're actually going to try and make clear the benefits of the way uh, we would like to see things done, not just materially in terms of conservation, but also in terms of people being, making them realise how sustainable they can be and also how cost effective. And I'm reasonably optimistic we can make ground. We won't change the world, we can't do that, but uh, we can hopefully win more friends. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm going to, uh, I think we have some microphones in different places. I'm going to take uh, some questions from the floor. We've got a few minutes before, you know, 10 minutes or so, to uh, see if people would like to make some comments or uh, have some questions. Yes, down the front here. Right here, and that's, that's, it's, it's, <laughs> that's better. Hi, um, this is picking up on um, something that you just mentioned, Jerry, um, about um, traveling exhibitions. As conservators, we would look at risk assessments with regards to objects and so on before sending an object on a traveling exhibition. Do you think we should be looking at impact factors and condition of the environment as well as the condition of the object when we look at whether objects should go abroad and travel the world and so on. I do. Um, now, I'm not against traveling exhibitions, nor, nor am I against international congresses, right? One, there, there's a certain contradiction when you gather 100 people from all over the world to talk about the pollution caused by jet airplanes. But um, I, think, I think the discussions about them will drive us 
to do better, to find more efficient ways. When we come to the decision that what we do now isn't sustainable and that we will lose these things after a certain period of time, our natural tendency will want to expand that period of time and we'll realize that the same old, same old isn't going to achieve that. So we'll come up with better ways of doing it. The number of conservators, the number of conservation scientists, the number of associated people working in heritage that are working on the specific problem of how to do things more efficiently related to climate change and our purpose is minuscule compared to the ones working in a very old-fashioned job description. You know, restoring at the bench, putting things up, identifying pigments, all those are great, but everybody should be giving a certain percentage of their time to make our collections and us more sustainable. Is this one here and then one here? Thank you all for your presentations and comments. I find this a very um, interesting topic and uh, one that I get quite in the middle of. Um, I have one foot a little bit in the built heritage working with architects and architectural conservators and the other foot a background in collections. And I'm finding um, First of all, I want to say that I think it deserves mention on the collection side that we've just barely scratched the surface. I agree with everything that Jerry's been presenting on the collection side. Uh, I think it deserves mentioning that um, some of the approaches that we're just starting to use for the last 10, 15 years is a risk assessment approach to collections with the idea of uh, what the impact of the climate per item would be. And I think that's important information because sometimes I'm having architects come to me now as a collections background person and say, what are those target points that we need to be designing into our buildings? So I just want to mention that there are some resources out there that we're just starting to begin to use. I don't think they're developed well enough yet and there also may be some other approaches to start exploring. Uh, I also think it's Helpful to mention that the National uh, Endowment for the Humanities, uh, a year and a half ago or two years ago, some of you may be aware, have started uh, a special program on, uh, and I, I won't get the title right, but a sustainability in collections care or collections management or something like that, which allows for this type of assessment plus an environmental assessment of the buildings, in particular, you know, for collections <coughs> and historic buildings. So, Again, there are a couple little resources that we're starting, at least in the United States, that I'm aware of, but we do need more development in this, in this arena. So thank you very much. And I think it's worth mentioning, I think uh, Jean and, and Jerry mentioned this, that uh, one of the projects that we've had uh, here in the GCI is uh, this issue of uh, managing the environment for museums in hot and humid climates. And that actually is looking at exactly that issue. Like, what is the nature of that collection? And what is the appropriate climate for that collection? And let's design the environmental system to match that, rather than just putting an environmental system in to match a standard, which may not be necessary for the objects that are actually displayed or the storage. So um, that, the, there's a book that's being developed that, uh, that captures that research that will be uh, coming out within the next couple of years as well. Um, I'd like to ask, in what Getty publication is there information on the material used to um, bulk the antiquities, to bulk the paintings, to um, glue the porcelain down to the, the services? In what getting publication um, do you have that kind of information, or is it sort of secret? Um. Oh, I guess I'm on the spot for the getting. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's not secret. And um, there's, on, on one extreme of transparency, there's the development of making a lot of the conservation records um, more accessible, and that will be coming in the future. But if you look at uh, any of the museum publications on conservation, and almost all of the GCI publications, you will always see a list of materials used. And there's a lot of attention paid both to um, the safety of the material, the, uh, the lasting quality of the material, but also attention paid to whether it's a pollutant or not, for example, 
terms of the topic we're talking about. So they're all out there. I mean, yeah. they're available. I mean, and where can they be had? I'm sorry? Where can they be had? Uh, the, the, the GCI, the museum, go online, look at the publications, and they're all listed there. But I mean the material itself. Oh, the material it's itself? Like a filament or whatever. Yeah. Uh, uh, sometimes the publications list the resources. We, we can talk after this, and I, I can recommend some of, some of those publications. Thank you. Do we have any other uh, questions or no? Okay, and that brings us to no, the no, Oh, sorry, sorry, David. Just to comment, really, um, um, just thinking about, in particular, the U.S. and the, you know, the the, I think I think changing the thinking that Jean was talking about, um, and you talked about policy, the importance of. For instance, the General Services Administration adopting the LEED standard, things like that. Um, you know, the, the, really the environmental movement that really got started in the 70s, I think in force, you know, basically they promoted a certain ethic and that's been promoted a lot through, um, through media, things like that. And it's been adopted um, internationally, I think, t to a fairly successful extent in a lot, of, lot, a lot of different parts of the world. And I think as part of the sustainability discussion, you know, that kind of thing is, I think, happening right now with a, a different, maybe a, a, an added layer to that, to the ethic that was uh, created in the past. And I think that it's really important for us to, to try to, um, to influence that. Um, what what Jean and others have talked about about things like reuse and the the uh, invested energy in, in reusing instead of you know creating new green buildings and so on. But I also think that that at least here in the U.S. the economy is so geared toward new construction. Mm -hmm. I mean that's something that's deeply embedded within national policy and. Uh, the law and tax incentives and those kind of things. So I, I, I think to really be successful, you have to attack at, at those different levels. You know, there's some of it maybe through through media um, promoting an ethic at a more public level, but then also at a policy level, um, changing the the you know so much is 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 geared toward new construction and and that approach that. You know, until those things are, are shifted also, the level of success will be limited. So it's just an observation. And, yeah. um, we use new housing starts to measure whether we have a healthy economy. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And at the same time, we're tearing down houses in Buffalo and Detroit and all of the cities where the abandoned houses are considered at risk. They easily could have 100 more years of life in them. We're tearing down resources because the population is shifting to other areas of the country. It's all woven together, but it's all, uh, it, we, I, I hope that we are coming into a period that has as much citizen involvement and citizen activism mm -hmm. as the 70s, because it will take a great deal of, of great chaos of voices in order to change the direction that we're going, mm -hmm. and, and it's necessary. All right, um, I would firstly like to thank our panelists, Chris Wood, Jean Curran, and Joe Padani for uh, joining us this evening and um, stimulating this discussion that we uh, are able to continue outside over a glass of wine. And I'd also like to thank Jim Marie and, uh, and Anna Zagorski who has organized uh, this evening's event for us. And thank you very much to our audience and please join us outside.